Hello, I'm Colin Green, and you are listening to Spike Pit. I've got a heavy dose of nostalgia for you folks in this episode. Back in 2019, I recorded 10 episodes about What's Up with D&D. They were an ongoing discussion with loads of called in contributions from listeners and I commented on each of the call-ins and it got to be 10 episodes, quite a long series for me, probably my longest. Well, I decided there is way too much waffle on there and I wanted to capture the thoughts, you know, what does the old school, us old grog yards, the old gamers, what do we really think about 5e? So I've distilled what folks had to say back then into one big episode for a summer nostalgia episode, a 2024 update. Hope you enjoy. Some real old friends and familiar voices included in this one that we don't hear from so much nowadays. I've been back looking at the the 5e rules. Long story short, I've mentioned it, that I was going to do it. Last few days, I've been looking over the uh, 5e DMG and the basic rules that I've printed off. It's a free download from Wizards of the Coast. It's got like um, four sections. Part one is creating a character. Part two is playing the game. Part three is the rules of magic. And then part four is Dungeon Master's Tools. And I'll tell you what, I'm pretty impressed with this. It's a tidy little package. Cuts out quite a bit of waffle it gets to the chase you've got four basic classes cleric fighter rogue wizard you've got four basic races dwarf elf halfling human and then as you'd expect a lot of the optional rules and twiddly bits are taken out and uh i think they've made a really good job with this and for free i mean it's amazing it's uh 180 page document you know if you're at all curious about 5e i would totally check this out i picked up the 5e dmg book when i say picked up i mean picked it up off the shelf i had it since uh, i started running but i reckon i must have read it with my eyes shut because um there is so much in there that I don't recall reading, seeing, or anything else. I think maybe I was in a little bit of a frenzy to get the game running and get started, and in my eagerness, concentrated on the player's handbook, or the uh, the book that came with the starter rules, already knowing how to play D&D, or so I thought. I just kind of launched off in me, my own version of what I understood to be 5e. We just had fun with that. But now, looking back, I realise, no, I wasn't really doing it justice. I didn't really give the um, the DMG a fair crack of the whip. And it's only through listening to like other anchorites and podcasts talking about, funnily enough, the first edition DMG and singing its praises up the wazoo, how it's their like, favourite book of all time and... They they really love it. I thought to myself, ah, well, I don't own that book, but I do own the 5th edition one. Can it be super, super different? Maybe. Knowing what I know about 5e, there's probably quite a few kind of callbacks and a, a similar ethos has gone into the preparation of the DMG as as it did with the 1st edition. So... You know, the, the AD&D DMG. So, lo and behold, what do I find? Lots and lots of random tables. Stuff to help you make this. Stuff to help you make that. Preparing your wilderness adventure. Preparing your dungeon adventure. Preparing your dungeon. Random dungeons. Creating NPCs. Creating monsters. Creating settlements. Creating the world. All the stuff that, you know, traditionally, you'd find in a DMG. But, there you go. I never actually really had your proper, like, hardcore AD&D DMG. So, 
I didn't fully appreciate what that meant. Well, the scales have fallen from my eyes, folks, and I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with that 5e DMG. Um, I should not have listened to the naysayers. And, um, man, I'm going to give it a good, a good try now and look at it with some fresh eyes and uh, see what I can make of it. I've already done some um, NPCs and come up with some adventures using the random tables and everything. And, yeah, I'm going to put aside a couple of my old favourites, like my Maze Rats, my uh, new big dragon stuff. Going to put that a little to one side, and I'm going to give this 5e a better crack of the whip. Oh, yeah, Colin. 5e DMG, that's where it's at. That first edition DMG's got a lot of nostalgia for me, but it reads like an obtuse novel. Um, the, the, the 5e DMG, though, it's all laid out. It's all in order. It doesn't talk crazy. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my first edition DMG, but when I'm prepping, I like to have both of those at my hand, and uh, I usually pick one or the other depending on uh, what I'm doing. And uh, actually, no, it doesn't depend on what I'm doing. It depends on how I'm feeling. You know, if I'm feeling like uh, some Gary, then I pull out first edition. If I'm feeling like, uh, you know, 5e, then I pull out that 5e because it's got some good stuff in there. I, I want to say the first 10 sessions or so from my uh, Midgard campaign, I made solely out of that book. Hey, Colin, this is Ray. I'm out on mile three of my walk, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm heavy breathing. But yeah. 5e is a solid system. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Rules as written. And if I play it or run it, I have no desire to mess with it. Uh, and I think the DMG is easily the best written of the three core books. A lot of good stuff in there. I will say my only complaints about 5e is that the world is just so bolted down. And I don't mean the fictional world. I mean that all the mechanics and everything make uh, the learning curve steep, but I'm not really afraid of a learning curve. Um, it makes it harder to invent in that world. So if you come up with a new spell, you really have to engineer it. It's hard to just toss one off, same way with a new monster. And sometimes characters, players, are paralyzed by choice. There's just so many options. So. But yeah, 5e, I mean, great system. And I absolutely agree that part of me responds to it negatively because it is the new thing and because there's material still being produced for it that makes it grow and change and hard to predict about what's going to happen with the system. There's a comfort zone in reaching back to an older system that you know is finished, you know, that somebody's written F-I-N at the end of it. And uh, it's not going to change on you. So if you decide to tinker with it, it's not going to be a moving target. What's up, Colin? It's Froth. I uh, wanted to let you know I was listening to your episode talking about 5e and enjoyed it. Um, I thought there was a lot of wisdom in what you were saying about introducing the different races into your game and having to make a place for them in your world. Like they've got like this one, like it's not a chicken, but you're like a bird, the Aarakocra. And so you'd have to like have like these bird people walking around and stuff. <laughs> so I don't know if that fits everybody's game. Ends up a little bit like the cantina scene in Star Wars, I think. But um, anyway, I, I, I like 5e2. I thought they did a good job on the DMG. My main issue running it was once it got up to something like between like 7th and ninth levels, it started getting more and more complex because all the different players have so many options and it's gotten to that analysis paralysis thing you get with the uh, third and fourth edition but i still like it quite a bit and hey see you next time running out of time hey colin it's joe uh, another great show man i love your stuff i love listening to you and what you got to say because you always have something interesting to say so we played 5e for the first year or so when it came out and we had fun enough with it but then we just got kind of bored um I don't know, man. I just think the skill system is just is just super lame in 5e. It's just so I just don't like it. And, you know, it's a fine game and people can play and like what they want. And I got no problems with that whatsoever. But just for us, it's it's not for us. 
Uh, but you know, it's obviously super popular. And so there are plenty of people out there who are enjoying it. And that's totally cool with me. I like 5e. I think it's brought me back into role playing. So, um, any game that's done that is good for me. Um, I think it's got some, some good points. I think actually having all the different character classes and the, the way that they change at level three to give a little bit more, um, path to your character, I think is a good thing. I think sometimes there's too many abilities and too many things to remember and too many sort of things you can do once a day, etc. But other times I think that those are good things and actually bring role playing to characters that are struggling a little bit to uh, play their character. I think some of the bad things about 5e is although it's uh, readily available now, I think it is quite expensive to people that are getting into the hobby or new to the hobby. I think there's plenty of good free games out there and low cost games. Um, I think they're probably easier to get into, less rules, less complicated for people that are completely new to role playing. But I think with the right um, GM or uh, DM, then I think any game can be introduced correctly. But there are too many abilities sometimes, too many or strange skill checks um, where some of the simpler systems get away with a lot of that or do away with a lot of that. So I think it's good and bad points. I'm interested to see what everyone else thinks. Hey there Colin, it's Matt. Hey on your discussion on 5e, you know Steve, my buddy, started a MeWe basic D&D 5e group and we started talking about 5e and you know, I, I wanted to give it an honest shot. I, I pulled up the PDF and I started reading it. And then I thought, you know what? I, I'm not a as written guy. So I was like, you know what? Let me go through this and just start taking things out that I know I wouldn't like as a GM. And so what I did is I printed it out and I got a red pen and I started marking off the parts that I wouldn't like. And about 10 pages in, I realized a quarter to half of every page wasn't for me. So I applaud everybody, you know, that's you playing the game and I love that Wizards has done this, but I just, I can't do it. And I think Ray has why I don't like it. And it's, he described it perfectly, which Ray always seems to do. God, I hate that guy, he's so good. The everything bo being bolted down. You know, I, as a GM, I feel that that is kind of, it's ropes tight around my ankle that won't let me be as free as I want. And that's a personal thing. I'm sure there's other guys that run like crazy with 5e that just absolutely love it. But for me, I am a lot of off the cuff, flying free kind of GM. And there is a learning curve. He's right, there is a learning curve. And frankly, I'd rather be playing a system that I enjoy to run than learning a system because other people want to play that system. It's Rob from Down in the Heap. Hey, Colin. 5e. Ooh, I don't know. I gave it a long try. DM'd it for probably 60 sessions or more, maybe, maybe up to 70. I don't know. Played a little bit in it. I think it's definitely more of a player's game than a DM's game. I bought all the books, I bought all the spell cards, a couple of the big scenarios, and you know, I think it's fine, and I think you're going the right route if you choose to just do the basic stuff, the basic rules, because I think the big problem is just the sheer weight of the fluff of all these classes and all these choices to make, and, and you're right about placing the honest on the players for learning the stuff because the DM can't learn all this stuff. In 5e, the, the players really need to pull their weight uh, in a game so involved in order to keep things moving really briskly at the table. And it's a challenging game, I think, for the DM because the monsters are so involved. They all have special powers, even things like giant rats and kobolds. Stat blocks are really big. It just... There's a lot going on in the game with the uh, with the action, reaction, bonus action stuff. Um, it takes a while to get the hang of, I think, to really understand the nuances. 
And I just personally didn't find that the nuances and involvement didn't add enough to the game's enjoyment uh, to make it superior to the OSR games. But just my opinion. Don't mean to be too hard on it, and you can have fun playing any game. Bye. Hey, Colin, it's Joe Richter. Uh, Yeah, so that was a little vague, my bad. But so just as a brief history, I cut my teeth with AD&D back in the 80s um, and then ended up playing a whole lot of Merp and stuff. And so I didn't really come back to actually D&D proper until 3.5 slash Pathfinder. The first character I ever made for that system happened to be a 13th level character, and so I was just thrown right in. And when I say that the skill system is boring with 5e, I mean it's because you never advance. I feel like all the characters feel very similar. I hate the fact that everyone has the same proficiency bonus. I just don't feel like it just is very fitting of similar characters. It just seems like it doesn't make any sense in my brain that a character would have the same exact skills his entire adventuring life that all progress at the same exact rate, whether or not he uses those skills or not. That system just doesn't make sense in my brain. And it just for me personally and our group, uh, it made all the characters feel very, very similar to each other. The fact that everyone... Almost every class can do magic, makes them all feel very similar. Uh, Yeah, so we gave it a shot, and we started playing it right when it came out. So the fact that there is a lot more out there now, we haven't explored, so things could be very different. But um, yeah, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. If you have more, I love to chat, so let me know. Peace out. Hey, Colin, it's Shane. Um, I think I'm going to do an episode about 5e. I think that might be the easiest way for me to get my thoughts on it. Uh, Excellent episodes as usual. I'm intrigued on your feelings and everybody's thoughts on it and the Collins and stuff. Uh, Collins to Colin. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do one. Um, Hopefully I'm coming from a good place when I talk about it. But anyway, cheers. Colin, Aaron Clark, just uh, finished listening to your three episode miniseries on D&D 5e. I am not a fan, but I don't believe that there is no bad wrong fun. Um, been playing 5e with the semi-regular group for about a year now, maybe a little longer. And I don't know, it's just not my cup of tea. The uh, I think Arfid kind of hit on it with the complexity of like the skills and the abilities. And, you know, we're all fifth, sixth level, and there's a lot of that complexity just growing uh, as the characters grow. We're doing milestone advancement. I'm not a fan of that. Courtney Campbell, a hack and slash blog, he wrote an interesting uh, blog post a couple of weeks ago about some changes to 5e to make it a little more old school. Uh, Those free rules are great. Um, I used them for the first three or four months of uh, my my sojourn with uh, 5e, which I think is now over. Yeah, that's all I got, man. Good to hear from you. Glad you're keeping on, keeping on. Hey, Colin, it's Froth. But yeah, I just wanted to say when you're talking about the average hit points with 5e and stuff, I uh, I use the average hit points in first edition because the uh, hit dice are eight, so I'll just make them all five. So if I've got a four hit dice, you know, it's, it'll be a 20 hit points. Sometimes I'll boost them if I want something to be really strong and I'll boost them up on the higher end or if I'm using a a written adventure I'll just use pretty much what they've got there, but if it's like, you know, ten lizard men and they've got You know three of them at seven and four of them at six and I just will just use an an average rather than try to track all that It just makes more work So anyway, yeah, I just go with five per hit dice usually uh, with old school. Hey Colin. It's Logan Really enjoying your 5e series. Hey, on that average hit points thing, I'm with you and Froth. I really feel like anything that prevents the GM from piddling around with dice by themselves is a benefit, especially when you're just about to get into action. Really, no matter what duration your show is, long, short, whatever, I'll be listening to Spike Pick. Have a good one. 
Hey, ho, let's go. The kids are losing their minds. Spike Pit. Love this 5e topic. I forgot to leave my impressions after I had provided the little bit of history on the DMG. Wanted to let you know that I am enthusiastically behind 5th edition. I have been DMing it for over three years now. I think the strengths of the system is the utility of it. The basic rules that you have described and shown to everybody that you can get for free are the reason why. You can go ahead and take things away from this system, but it's very difficult to break it, in my humble opinion. And if you do want to go complex, they've provided you with enough support materials and things such as D&D Beyond to help you manage the game, both as a player and a DM. I think it's a big hit. And I also love all of the OSR games, too, now being a big supporter of Old School Essentials. Take care. Great show. Hey, Colin. This is Matt. Just a quick comment on your Milestone XP. When I was running the Black Hack, you know, Black Hack uses Milestone XP. And we only did three sessions, but I was in the back of my head, you know, evaluating how I would handle it if I ended up you know, running that into a campaign or something. And I really did not care for not giving out XP. At the end of the game saying, great game guys, thanks for playing, see you next week. It really felt weird not to hand out XP. In addition, I secretly, as a GM, award great players more XP because you guys kick butt. And not doing that, I felt like I was shortchanging good players of additional XP. Hey Colin, this is James Richards. Just wanted to call and uh, reach out and say thanks for what you do. I think Froth has it right when he's encouraging folks to leave some kind of feedback on these blogs. Uh, But I think that applies to the Anchorite community as well. Uh, It's growing. I've been listening to a lot of folks, some folks I'm just discovering, I can only stand social media so much, but uh, these podcasts have been really good for me, Uh, I listen to a lot of you folks while I'm crafting dungeons or drawing maps or, you know, making my silly monsters. Uh, and you're all good company, and uh, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate your positivity. Colin, for shame, you haven't read Monster Manual? Oh my God, there's so much good stuff in there. Uh, let me be honest, I'm on uh, P, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm reading it a little bit each night, and there's some really good stuff in there. Um, I have, um, since Mike Shea uh, was called out by Mike Merles by not re- for not reading the Monster Manual. I have read every book that has come out, which was uh, Mordenkainen's Forward, I think. I haven't read Velos all the way through. Um, but I have read those monster details, and there's so much good lore and so much good stuff in there. Um, but this kind of goes back to what Ray Otis was saying when everything's, like, kind of locked down. And I don't believe that with 5e. I believe that, um, my opinions, there there's some wishy-washy things in there. Um, stealth is one of them. It's big. It gets used a lot. Players want to use stealth, and it's not exactly clear where it's going to be. But everything fits really tightly in 5e. And even if you dink around with some of that stuff, it it doesn't fall apart, which is really nice. You can pull things out, and you can add them together, um, add new things in, bracket new things on the side, um, and it all kind of works together with this this core rule, right? Um, And I think that it being so locked down, as Ray said, makes it easier when you go to create something, you have this blueprint of things that are, has already been made for you that you can totally copy. All right, that's all I got to say this time. Hey, Colin Che, uh, just want to respond on the 5e stuff, really. Uh, I'm with kind of Joe Richter to a point. Um, I really, really, really want to like 5e, and I've played plenty of it, and it was fun for the players. Um but I'll tell you what, all the character classes feeling the same. Okay, there are lots of options, but show me a wizard that hasn't taken Firebolt because I've only seen one uh, of dozens. And seriously, yeah, they all do end up feeling very samey. Um, and I kind of as GM got bored, and I think, again, it's back to this thing. It's a player's game, lots of detail for the player, lots of fun for the player. 
Jimming, yeah, it got a bit dull. I just wasn't excited by it. And, uh, but I'm back and I'm looking at it and that's all down to you, dude. So thank you for encouraging me to take another look. Hey, Colin, it's Cody. So I think you're right. Um, using the 5e basic rules, the free PDF, um, it's pretty much good to go out of the gate. Um, and yeah, I ran, I ran one session of it, um, in kind of an OSR style and two of the players actually died. So here's my problem with fifth edition is it just takes so long to make a character compared to an OSR system. Um, I guess if the if the players are actually already familiar with the content, that could probably help speed it up. Um, but for me, it just takes a little too long. Like the guys I played with, when I killed two of their guys, it took them about 15 minutes to get a new guy ready. And, you know, we were in the middle of a dungeon, which is for me is kind of a long time. I know with like BX or even, you know, any other kind of OSR system, it's about five minutes, which is a little more manageable. But um, in regards to the magic system, I actually think it's pretty simple. Um, a lot of the spell stuff, uh, I mean, yeah, so your char your players have to have their characters ready. They have to understand how their spells work. And that may be something you set up in like a session zero um, where you guys just kind of go over everything, make sure everyone understands the rules. But I would say um, 5e, it's perfectly serviceable. I could say you could run it as written and it would be fine. All right, last thing. Um, I found a blog post and I'll send it to you on Discord for... Um, how to do 5e monsters on the fly in, in the much space as a business card. So a really small amount or, you know, it'd be a really small stat block. You don't have to go as in depth as they do with um, the monster manual stats where it's, you know, half a page. Um, but again, I mean, if you're, if you're looking to recruit new players into a game, I would say start with 5e because that's what's popular and, um, and maybe run it in an OSR style. I don't know. I used to, I used to feel that 5th edition was more of a player's game than a DM's game, but I feel that um, in the past, maybe the players didn't know the system as well, so I was having to look more rules up, and it was not as fun to DM. So I think if you get people in there who know the rules better or understand the system better, uh, maybe that's not the case. And the second thing is, if I'm going to the shelf to pick a new game, if I'm going to run a new campaign, 5e is probably not the first thing I go for. Um, if I'm in the mood for something crunchy, then maybe I'll pick it up, but I think at first I'm probably going to go BX or DCC over 5th edition. So, all right, man, that's the last one, I promise. Um, keep it up. I'm really enjoying these, and uh, I'll catch you later. I'm getting quoted a lot for saying that D&D &D 5e is pretty bolted down, and many are wondering exactly what I meant by that. I'm of two minds about how to respond. First of all, I'm kind of reluctant to explain what I meant. Uh, as Mark Twain put it, it's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> but, uh, of course, having said it, I probably should explain it. Um, by bolted down, I mean that I feel like there is system underpinning everything in 5e. Too much system, too many stats, too many things spelled out for me. It's all just a bit too much, um, at least for me as a GM. I don't mind playing it so much. In episode 58 of my own cast, Plundergrounds, in the bonus content, I talked about the free play between engaging with the combat mechanics. I prefer that. But we are going to be playing 5e again soon in the Bruise, Bones, and Blades Club, and I'm perfectly okay with that since I'll be a character player. As for unbolting 5e, I wouldn't. Uh, instead, I say lean into it. The fact that there is system underpinning everything can be a strength if you let it be that. It just means to me that um, you need to embrace 5e the way it is. And frankly, I'm a big fan of playing games rules as written. I'm pretty leery these days of changing mechanics, though I'm perfectly fine uh, messing with the setting and flavor. If I feel like I want different mechanics, I play a different game or I write my own, of course. So I, I don't know how much unbolting you could do of 5e. I feel like the minute you start removing things, you make it a different game and you kind of break a social contract with the players who are counting on all that material. Hey, Colin, it's Joe. Uh, just wanted to call in about this 5e thing. I hear everybody's doing it. Um, yeah, I like the game. I'm, I'm playing in a, in a game now um, run by a friend of mine. Um, and we've been playing, uh, I don't know, for about three months, I guess. It seems, you know, I'm still kind of getting to grips with the, with the more high-powered character. Um, you know, I played a lot of 3E back in the day, but I haven't 
haven't been there for a while, you know. Um, so that's something that I, I'm not sure how I feel about. Uh, the other thing that kind of bothers me about it is the races. I, I think that like the Tieflings, the Dragonborn, um, kind of break down those uh, t- traditional fantasy tropes. Um, but, you know, I understand why they did it. Um, I like the basic game as well, and there's a, there's a project out there, and I think I, I mentioned it to you once. Um, it's called Into the Unknown, and uh, right, pulling a Jackson. Um, so Into the Unknown is, uh, I guess it's an OSR sort of take on 5e, where it breaks down, you know, the classes to they use races class, um, and it's basically the four core classes. Um, it's pretty interesting looking. I haven't played it yet. Uh, takes a lot of the bloat of the game away. Uh, but if you can find it, there used to be a G plus group, and I know that there is a MeWe group. Um, I don't know if you can get those files anymore, but I know it's still in the works and it's going to be released. I think it's like pay what you want or something. Um, but it looks pretty cool, and I thought I'd get it out there. Uh, yeah, take a look. I'll see you. Hey, Colin, it's Hobbs from Random Screed. I got your message today, and I started listening to all your 5e episodes, and I'm about halfway through number four. And, uh, man, I have a lot to say about it, and I'm not sure how many episodes, how many messages this will uh, take. Um, first of all, I have played it. I was really excited to buy 5th edition. Uh, it's the first time I bought in any core rule book since third came out and i wasn't a big fan of third even though i found other people say they think i would like it anyway fifth edition i like the basic game i ran it um i've ran and played fifth edition multiple sessions i don't know if it's been a hundred but it's been quite a few and i always just feel like i'm it's missing something and i wonder if it's a situation of less is more you know less is more so when you have everything and then you put more and more stuff on top of it it can make you feel like you're not going to find all of the things Uh, another aspect of it is this characters feel too powerful to me in the early levels the early levels are my favorite and when the characters feel too powerful, i realize that all they did is up the power level of the monsters then to uh, compete with the character levels and then you just have more and more stuff which kind of leaves me Uh, Blase. Um, Character options. More options on the character sheet don't make more options in play. So the less options you have, the more overall things that you can do in a game. In my opinion, because what they've done is tried to make everything that you might come up with in a game and then apply it in a character class or a... In an older game, you would just come up with those rulings and apply them as you went. Um, so all in all I've played it I continue to buy books for it to see if I would like it more and then they just sit on my shelf until someone says they're going to play it and then I look at them and then I put them back and I don't really use it very much I really do like the fact that people are playing it and uh, people are in love with it but I mean I don't really know how many more people are actually playing it I do know people are buying the books though if you notice the difference anyhow for me i would say meh i'd play it if someone wants to i'd run it if someone wants to but it isn't my game of choice by any means i think that they're trying to do too many things in order to use uh, al play you know organized play and that kind of limits what it could have been in my opinion so anyway hope that helps later Hi there, just wanted to continue the conversation on the 5e Dungeons and Dragons. Um, been playing BX on Kalmata recently and uh, been reading some of the older rule sets. Uh, and I'm starting to come around to the idea that especially the basic 5e Dungeons and Dragons is probably an easier game system to learn if you're brand new to the hobby. Uh, obviously a lot of the players on the OSR have been playing the game for 20, 30, 40 years so a little bit uh, stuck in their ways with regards to how things work and they find it easy to do rulings rather than actual rules uh, someone might, like myself um, yeah I've been playing d for a long while but I play a lot of board games 
So I'm used to rule books that tell me how to do things. Just doing my Jackson. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I play a lot of board games where rules are written, and if you have a query on the rules, it's very uncommon that you can go through the rule book and not find exactly what you need, the way it's worded, or even if you really have to go onto a forum on the website of the game company and they will explain the, the query. Um, but with BX and some of the older games, you could play one game with someone on Tuesday and they would interpret a rule completely different and have a different house rule for a, a ruling than someone that you played on a Thursday night. So at Kalmar at the weekend, we were trying to turn undead and we weren't quite sure how often we could do it. Um, I wasn't sure how long the, the undead stay turned. But in the new basic 5e, it was quite clear and concise. Anyway, just some thoughts. Hey Spike, but this Larry with Follow Me and Die. Been finally got caught up on your 5e series of episodes. And I haven't played a lot of 5e. The one thing I've noticed is if it's really hard to pick up a character in the middle. So if you didn't level up a character and learn all the new abilities and traits and whatnot that that character has, you're really handicapped trying to figure it out. My best example of that is I happened to be a player in Satine Phoenix's very first convention game that she ever ran. And the character I had, I think, was fourth or fifth level and had all kinds of if ands, or buts for when they could do things. And it turns out that the character had advantage on initiative, but it was on the back of the character sheet that we were using. So I didn't even figure that out till the last few rounds. And I'm focused on the character sheet because as a longtime player, I know how to roll up an old style character. With 5e, the order of the stats are in a different order. I believe that changed prior to 5e, and I understand why they're in that order. But I have played with the original order of the six stats that I automatically fall into the mindset that's the order these numbers are in. So that's a real challenge. The other thing as a player is I want to know where I get the information so that I can understand how and why that number on the character sheet is what it is. And for that reason, everything that goes on the character sheet needs to be clearly laid out in the player's handbook. I got no real beef with 5e. Folks should play it if they want to, have fun with it. It's a perfectly fine game. But one of the main arguments I hear in its favor is how modular it is, how you can take stuff out and add stuff in. And that argument for its favor doesn't really make sense to me because that's basically true of every single role-playing game ever. You've always been able to do that with role-playing games. And so I just don't understand why that's such a common argument in 5e's favor. Thanks again, man. You're awesome. Keep up the great work. Peace out. And that, as they say, is a wrap. Big thanks goes out to you, the listener, for taking a bit of time out of your day to listen to Old Spike Pit. Take care, and I'll catch you later.